Hey everyone, Ben Coomer Radio, episode number 236, he is correct, and I am back with Shelley McCoy, but for anyone that's listened on pod, uh, the video, I will explain why I'm dressed up as if I'm about to go out and walk the dog, it's because I've run out of heating and hot water in my house, so it's like an absolute igloo, so I am dressed up like a Suffolk farmer, um, and it's alright because I live you know, I am have relations that are farmers in Suffolk, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just playing the part. Shelley, um, while I talk to myself, um, sorry, hello. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to have chats with myself. When you work from home, you get very used to largely talking to yourself and the dog, and you just happen to be observing on the fact that I'm just having a chat with myself. You're having an inner monologue about your wardrobe, which I'm fine with. Exactly. Um, so Shelley, we introduced you on last week's show. We've got you back. Um, apparently you are half decent, so we're going to have another crack and expand <laughs> on some of the things that we talked about last time. Um, last time uh, we kind of delved into your story, which I didn't really know about. It was very interesting. Uh, we were able to evolve kind of why and how you got into CrossFit, and I think that's a great thing for people. I suppose cranking straight in today's content... Um, we breached the subject last week of what is evolving in CrossFit and CrossFit sort of trying to combat some of the negative things that have been said about it, the criticism that it's been getting. Now, one of the things we talked about was training. We didn't get time to talk about nutrition. Now, nutrition, back in the original day, from what I saw, and this is just from kind of a consumer and observer, we saw that CrossFit and Paleo were very closely aligned, especially kind of from the American influence originally. And it was very much, don't eat gluten, don't eat dairy. Um, it inadvertently went high carb. Being involved in CrossFit, how have you seen that change over the last three, four, five, six, however many years? And where do you see CrossFit nutrition right now? Okay, so originally when I first started CrossFit, um it was actually discussed more with me about zone nutrition. Okay. Uh, so putting your um, meals in blocks and your carbohydrates, your proteins, your fats. Whereas I did like I did get a bit of education on paleo and the benefits of it. But if we're talking about nutrition for performance or nutrition for health and life, um, I think they're two separate things. Uh, they definitely vary anyway. So. As far as the paleo was concerned previously, um, that probably would have suited me at the start of my journey um, because I was overweight, sedentary, and wasn't doing an awful lot. And I didn't also have that much education behind me regarding what I should eat and when. And um, Paleo is a very simplistic form of eating and it's a good way to educate people. And if they want to know more, they can. There's more out there for them to be able to learn. However, what I would say is that it's a very, actually, I spoke to my nutritionist, Carl, about this other day, as well as Mike. And what we were saying was that um, it's very simplistic. It's, it's single ingredient meals and you, you look at your proteins and your fats and your carbs and your lean meats and your nuts and seeds and berries and you get your carbohydrates from your vegetables. And that's very good and it's a good thing to get started on for people's education, but as far as, as CrossFit's evolved, the standards massively evolved. Mm. And what we would see three years ago go into some of the highest level um, now would be like the warm-up. It's insane. It just went off the charts. And I actually was having a conversation with a girl a couple nights ago, um, and she went to regionals in, I want to say, 2012 or 2013. And she, um, she was saying that one of the workouts was Diane. Now, Diane is 21.59 deadlifts and handstand push-ups. That's it. That was the workout. Whereas you look at the original standard now, and it's like Diane plus wall balls plus a time cap of and max ring muscle-ups. And there's so many added elements because the standard of athlete is increasing. I think with that goes the standard of nutrition and what the requirement is. Paleo is great. Gives you a lot of energy. It gives you everything that you need but there possibly is a little bit um lacking in that so and um, it's very good crossfit athlete i watch all of her documentaries her name's lauren fisher do you know who that is i don't know you should look her up she's great so she's relatively young and um, and she says that she likes to stick to 
the majority of her diet likes to be paleo, but she likes to add in additional carbohydrates like sweet potatoes and yams. And, um, so, and I would say that that's where I see the nutrition side of things now. People are massively focusing on the performance for CrossFit because it's high intensity. Um, and it is constantly varied, and you are sometimes lifting heavy weights, and you do need a lot. You, every day you need to be pretty fresh. And the most important thing, I think, for this is the recovery element. What nutrition can do for you in your recovery. <coughs> so, in terms of, okay, so looking at your nutrition and from what we've just discussed, what do you think is important for you to look at in terms of recovery? I need a lot of energy in my body. Um, I, Carl and I, uh, my nutritionist Carl Greenslade, he's great and he's given me a lot of education recently um, and we started off playing around with my macros and um, just to see what, how I did best and how, to be honest, it's not about how I look and um, we don't need to know um, that I have abs, it's not about that, I don't need the physical, um, it's not a physical ambition for me to be able to see that, whereas my macros very much determine my recovery for the fact that I was growing. I like because I'm still evolving. I'm still a relatively new athlete. I wouldn't say that I've settled into any kind of pattern yet. I'm, I'm still in my first couple of years. So with that, and um, everything I do, I still get like doms, and I still wake up and feel like I've been hit by a bus sometimes. Um, and that I've got a lot better at that and managed to manage that better. The higher my calories have went. Carnally died when he seen what I was eating to start with because I was hitting CrossFit every day and I was training in the morning, training at night, and then when I showed him my food diary for the first couple of weeks, he was like, "Uh huh." And the rest, mm. how are you still running? He thought I was running on fumes, um, and so my calorie in intake has doubled since working with with a nutritionist. And from that, I would say I do wake up feeling fresh, and my dogs are a day or two max and that's only if I really worked on something that I haven't yet challenged mm -hmm. so for me it's the calories I need to get it in and um, I need to constantly be eating constantly hydrating I do supplement with a couple things um, which I think I've found a massive difference in recently actually um, and yeah but I, I would prefer to have whole foods most of the time mm -hmm. but I love a protein shake because it's so quick and it's so easy and I'm starting with clients early in the morning and I'm not finishing till late at night. I don't want to eat around clients and that can be rude sometimes. So I would just have a shake when I need them. Um, but yeah, for me it's the, the quantity of food that I'm eating and um, the way it's been broken down for me. Cars, I'm, now I love them. And I used to think that they were bad before. And now you know they're good. Now I know that without them, I'm useless. <laughs> even like concentration levels, even like willingness to get out of bed. I need a lot of cards for that. Yeah, I totally agree. So you are a functioning day-to-day -day CrossFit athlete. You train with the purpose to compete at the highest level you can. What yes, does a full-on training day look like for you, training-wise and nutrition-wise? Okay, so first thing in the morning when I get up, I'll eat and I'll have coffee. I love an Americano with pouring cream and sprinkled cinnamon. That's my jam. So I'll have one of them first thing in the morning and I'll generally have porridge with a scoop of banana awesome protein. I like that to mix and I take it with me. I'll also pack granola and yogurt for after my first training session with berries. Um, my first training session depends if I have a 7 a.m. client. If not, that's when I'll train, and otherwise, I generally don't have an 8 or a 9, so I'll train either 8 or 9 a.m., um, have my porridge first thing in the morning, turn up, work with one client at 7, and at 8 or 9, I'll train, and that'll generally be something to get me moving. I would prefer to do light conditioning first thing in the morning, so I have a look at my program. I currently follow MoveFit programming by Mike Catris, um, and I'm really enjoying that, so First thing in the morning, I'll do like the conditioning element. So if there's rowing, something that gets me a bit sweaty, loosens me off. Um, I can get stiff. Like I love mobility. I'm a mobility specialist. I, I like I teach it all the time and I do it all the time. But I need it first thing in the morning. I'm like cardboard. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's because I'm getting old because I'm not really useful. But <laughs> it, might be, <laughs> it might be that reason. 
So first thing in the morning, I like to get moving, I like to get my blood going. So eight or nine, that's what I'll do, something conditioning. And then I'll have granola, yogurt, um, possibly a shake at that point or a bar. And then I prep meals like three times a week. So later on in the day, I have eat alarms on my mobile phone. So a minute ago, you heard like a dingling. That was my eat alarm. Just reminds me to be regular with my food, just keeps it in the front of my mind. Um, so I'll tell you exactly when I eat. I'll have a look at these. I think the next one's 10.30, um, so alarms. Yeah, so my first one, get up and go to work. <laughs> and then that's like six o'clock. And then um, I'll eat around about nine after training. And then 10.30, I'll eat then. My next one's not till one. Um, so 10.30 to one, I will work, whether I've got clients in the clinic or mobility clients or PT or athletes, one-on-one -on -one with athletes. Um, I'll do that up until about one and then I'll eat at one and then I'll train two till four. four. Two till four is like my favorite time. That's when I'll do all my skills work, all of my heavy lifting. That's when I'll fill my Instagram videos because I've woken up a bit and I've managed to put a bit of makeup on and like, brush my hair and that. So two till four, that's when I do the majority of my training. And um, the training program I have now is really quite extensive. It's like A, B, C, D, E and F. So like I'll probably do two components then first thing in the morning and try and do the most of them between two and four. So like for instance today I had engine work and it was um, deadlifts with calorie rowing with handstand push-ups with bar muscle ups um, and first thing then I also had strict press, I also had deadlifts as a separate component and then there was split jerk and power jerk and stuff in there too and um, so I did most of that then. If I don't manage to finish those elements then um, I'll do them later on at night when I finish around about 8 o'clock. Um, but I, I'd quite like to keep it as a morning session and 2 to 4. So when I finish work, I can go home because I have meal prep to do. Um, I eat again at 3.30 and then again at half 6 and then before bed if I need to. I'm actually on flexible dieting, so I track my food. Um, every time I eat, I put it into my log and I have a look at what that meal would have consisted of and how much I have left during the day. So when it comes to nighttime, if I've got, say, 40 grams of carbohydrates, 20 grams of protein and like 12 grams of fat, I might be able to have a cinnamon raisin bagel with butter and peanut butter as well. <laughs> Not that I plan my day around having that left, but when it happens, I'm pretty happy. So, um... Yeah, but then like my meals during the day, I love salmon, asparagus, sweet potato, and um, I'm a big fan of rice. I really like to like smash up chicken into wee bits with rice and sweet corn. And Carl's always like, wow, great meal. I love it. Um, so that's generally what I'll have in my bag. And I've got this really cool little rucksack that's got like a little component part in it where you put two ice blocks and it takes three meals and two shakers at the side. So I'm like... It, I've got it sorted. Um, so I do that every day. Train in the morning, train in the afternoon. I eat as much as I can through the day. Um, but we're trying to up my portions and decrease the amount that I'm eating so that I'm not constantly turning over food all day. Because I do feel a bit like, sometimes I do feel a bit bloated from that, a bit heavy. Um, like, then you need to train again. And you're like, just yeah. eat it again. So yeah. um, Carl's kind of evolving my eating schedule now now that because i was in a heavy competition season there and now i'm not so now's the time to see what works best for me mm. and it's a bit inconvenient time management wise like i couldn't think of anything worse than eating six seven times a day I, i'm usually about four times a day yeah otherwise I, when do you work <laughs> clients too you don't want to be like hey margaret do you mind if i have my salmon and sweet potato Right, give us some rowing and then do some burpees. And I'm stood there eating. Like, I feel really rude. Yeah. So that's where shakes come in massively for me. Um, what's that noise? I don't know. Oh, it's Mike. He's dying. Oh. I, I, I'll explain this, by the way. I'm in an altitude um, exposure clinic. It and sounds so, like you're in an altitude chamber. Yeah, like, I know this isn't real. Like, I wouldn't wear a vest and, like, be here anywhere. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm here today. I'm in, it's called Fit Air in Cardiff. So it's really cool. Um, altitude exposure for athletes. Okay, uh, so you might as well tell the listeners why are you doing altitude training? What is the benefit to you as an athlete? Well, I actually posted about this yesterday. I find it very interesting. So basically, um, do you know what? 
I, I wrote it and I'd really organized my thoughts on this. So I'd rather just tell you what I actually wrote because it's very organized. Go and on it's just, tell you right now. How about you, Ben? How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm just very cold. Yeah, that's not great. You should do some burpees. They're great. But it burpees. looks colder at the top of the mountain in the background. I know. That's why I said, like, when this first pinged on, I just thought, oh, no. People are going to think I'm outside and I'm wearing a vest. Okay, so what I said. Yesterday, I had an afternoon session at the Altitude Exposure Clinic, and here's why. Exposure to high altitude could theoretically improve an athlete's capacity to exercise. Exposing the body to high altitude causes it to acclimatize to the lower level of oxygen available in the atmosphere. Many of the changes that occur with acclimatization improve the delivery of oxygen to the muscles, the theory being that the more oxygen will lead to the better the performance. Um, so for any type of exercise lasting longer than a few minutes, the body must use oxygen to generate energy. Without it, muscles simply seize up and can become damaged. This type of exercise is called aerobic exercise, meaning with oxygen. Um, so the body naturally produces a hormone, EPO, um, which stimulates the production of red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the muscles. Up to a point, the more blood cells um, you have, the more oxygen you could deliver to your muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so. There are a number of other changes that occur during acclimatization, acclimatization which may help um, athletic performance, including an increase in the number of small blood vessels, an increase in the buffering capacity, which is like your ability to manage the buildup of waste, um, and changes in the microscopic structures and function of the muscles themselves. But there's so much to be learned about this, and it's probably a resource that we don't we, we don't know enough about yet, um, and we don't use often enough, but it's on www.fitair.com if you want to know about it. And I know the founder, Spencer Gardner, he's put up a couple studies on there that you'll probably find really interesting. And it just gives you a little bit of a better understanding of how this could be used as like a tool for athletes. It's right here and they have this up and the graph on the screen is awesome. <laughs> well, athletes have been using attitude training for like, what, 20 years? 15, 20 years? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Um, Spencer... Do you happen to know how long people have been using Alton the chain? Come say hi to Ben. This is Spencer Gardner. Hi Ben. This is Ben Kuma. Hello Ben. So how long, do you know how long people have been using Alton the It really kicked off Mexico Olympics. That's when they really saw the benefits. 68. Six, 68 or 86? 86. 86. 86. Um, which is where they saw athletes who have been training at altitude uh, were having benefits. Because I couldn't state what height it was, but I know it was at altitude. And that's where people realise that there are significant benefits to be had. Okay, cool. And what do you think? Do you think those benefits will ever reach down to the average man, or it is a athlete training capacity thing? Uh, I think at the moment, what I'm trying to do is make it accessible to your know, average gym goer. So you know, your velothons, your CrossFit, all these low-level CrossFit competitions, all these uh, competitions are out there, uh, and people, I think, would love to have access to altitude training but currently it's the sort of mo farmers the team sky and that sort of area who only have access to it so the idea is to see if it is possible that's what i'm trying to do make it accessible to everyone so everyone can sort of benefit from it because everyone we've had here has had benefits 100 percent. interesting so, all right fair enough nice. cheers spencer okay. so that's what i'm doing today because there is nothing like this up near me um, but I came down to Cardiff to get a couple of days in training and um, I wanted to get used to the box down here and um, work with my coach for a bit. So it's really a really good opportunity for me to come along and just experience something different and see what the benefits are. Plus, I love to learn and the research and stuff behind it is really interesting. I know that actually you would probably, you'd really like it too. So it's really just from that side of things. Fair enough. Nice. Um, all right. Well, moving on, I'm interested to understand CrossFit as a competition metric because for me the general public assume that crossfit is a a style of training but from what i understand crossfit is a way that an athlete is being assessed so if you train for crossfit like if i went to your crossfit gym and we did crossfit we wouldn't necessarily be doing kipping pull-ups and things like that because it no. is not quote unquote what is trying to be delivered from the training aspect, but it might be something that is assessed in competition. 
So yeah. can you kind of clear up this, like, I suppose, what is CrossFit as yeah, a com- course, competition yeah. component and how we see it? Well, what, you, uh, what you've just given an example of is a perfect example. Like, I don't actually train kipping and butterfly movements on the bars that often because that's a speed element to a strict strength movement. Strict pull-ups is the order of the day most times. So people always hate on you when you're like doing a pull-up and you're moving at speed or you're using your legs to, to gather momentum. But that's because in a competition, it might be 50 of them. And it's all to test the, the muscular endurance and the endurance of the movement. That's why we, we throw in momentum to that. But CrossFit is a training modality where we use um, strength and balance and agility. And we look at 10 different components of fitness and how we could train them separately and together so that you, as yourself, as a human, you can use all elements that you are capable of. I am capable of being strong and flexible and having a good cardio respiratory system, um, as well as being skillful in gymnastics, as well as being skillful in swimming and running and rowing and all the things that my vessel here could do. Um, So when you come in to train CrossFit, yeah, okay, maybe a couple months down the line, you might develop into these skills and adding speech to them, but only if you wanted to compete with them because... If you were just coming to me and you were like, I'd like to be fit, I'd like to be strong, I've got a couple kids, I want to be like healthy at their graduation, which is generally what I get, um, mid-range age population, middle-aged women, middle-aged men um, that maybe haven't trained in a while and they're looking, sometimes they're looking for a bit of a quick fix and they've heard that this is really difficult and it'll, it'll get you shredded in no time, which is fine because it is high intensity and if you stick to the program, your body will look better. Um, but we would always get you to come in and start working on those um, fitness elements, your strength. So it would always be, we have a five and drive rule at FFG CrossFit. If you cannot do five strict pull-ups with good form without struggling, we're not going to teach you anything else. We're not going to teach you kipping or butterflies. And also, I would say that things like that, um, they require a lot of stability in the body, which is built over time using strict elements. um, And like, we will probably start you off with quite small based movements and quite um, the compounds like your, your squat, your deadlift, your press, as well as push-ups, sit-ups, and that's all con- considered your gymnastics. Push-ups, sit-ups, burpees, um, pull-ups, and then any other skills that we can help you with, like even things like pistol squats, one-legged squats. That's not something that we would give to people generally unless they need it because – you can squat and strengthen your legs in other ways, box jumps. You don't need to squat on one leg. But if you wanted to be a competitive athlete, these are skills you're going to have to learn. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't say – I would say you probably needed a solid six months or so just in the strength cage, just being able to use your body correctly in the right movement patterns. For me, I'm really rigid with how I work with people. I'm like, unless you can do this on a PVC pipe with perfect form, I'm not giving you any weight. Um, Because I'm all about strengthening positive movements and and positive strength gains instead of just saying, right, well, you probably could manage this. Let's see. I don't, that's not how we've ever worked. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So looking back at the pull-up example, when the original CrossFit programming came about, would they have said, right, we're going to get you to do 50 pull-ups. And the first ever time they did a CrossFit competition, everyone did 50 pull-ups. And then some dude went, hang on, I can be faster at this if I work out how to create efficiency in this movement. And then did the kipping pull-up evolve or did the kipping pull-up end up being the original exercise or did it come about from creating efficiency and speed? Now, what I'm about to say is opinion-based. I couldn't actually back this up with research, but from my logical perspective on that, I'm going to say that it's always been about the strict strength. The speed element is brought in for high rep, high capacity, Um, and so we're never taught to kick for high... We're never taught to kick at all or butterfly at all unless you would require it. But generally... There isn't 50 pull-ups in my workouts or many programming workouts in an actual box, in a CrossFit facility, because we're not testing your endurance, we're training it. Um, So we're teaching you how to build it. 
we're teaching you how to be better, we're teaching you how to pull better, to be in a better position, to maintain core tension, to use your arms correctly, to engage the posterior chain. We're not there to say how many can you do or how big a set could you do. Or So I would say, in my own opinion, I would imagine that this came around for efficiency of movement in competition. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Okay, um, so looking back at CrossFit as a whole, where you are right now, where do you think we will start to see CrossFit moving? Do you see that there are any changes starting to happen, that they're going to start to yeah. take? Okay, you seem excited already, go. Totally. There's a study just been released that CrossFit's going into schools. Now, that might freak a lot of you out, and people probably just like, oh! But in a controlled setting, what are we actually doing? We're teaching youths how to use their body correctly to the, to the best of its capacity. So to optimize their balance and their agility and their willingness to train cardio, cardio is cardio, but the willingness to run and to swim and to jog and to cycle, uh, as well as to use their body weight and strength. And, and anyone like CrossFit are really hard to kill. That's a legit fact. And I think that the more that it's going into schools, working with kids, what's the biggest problem right now in the UK? Obesity, lack of movement. Smashed it. And so what is this combating? Two yep. birds, one stone. And because CrossFit, like everyone that does CrossFit is a massive enthusiast. They're all like, oh my God, have you heard, do you know what the first rule of CrossFit has been? Always talk about CrossFit. Smashed it. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, people that love CrossFit are starting to say, right, let's take this to schools. And maybe you don't call it CrossFit. Maybe you just call it Fit for Kids or High Intensity yeah. Boot Camp or whatever. Maybe you take the stigma away. But um, yeah, like, so I see CrossFit massively evolving into the general population, people getting a better understanding of it. And there's documentaries now on Netflix, and people are starting to say, oh, what's that? What is this? Like, let's watch this tonight. And they're putting their pizza away. And they're like, babe, do you know where my trainers are? Like, they're getting in the mood. Um, and then we're starting to see a bit of a rise in the box as well, like in our gym, because people are starting to, to get curious. Like, what is it? Why are all these women, like, looking so good? Why are all these men so strong and so fit and so able? Um, so I'm actually really excited. For the next five years in CrossFit, I think we're going to see it shoot through the roof. And I, I probably wish I'd caught it a bit earlier. Again, I'm not old, but... I'm definitely not young. So I wish I'd probably caught this like this um, hype a little bit younger and learned a bit more, a bit younger. But I think the next five years as a coach specifically, it's going to be very exciting for the people that are coming through the box, people who want to get involved. Um, like you're talking about it now, 236 podcasts in and you're broaching the subject now. Mm. So it shows that there's evolution in people's education and what people want to see. So our first podcast seemed to have received a lot of positive feedback. People were like, I had like, I'm going to say 40 messages, private messages from people saying, maybe can I get advice on this? Or I thought you were great. Or do you know what? You've changed my mind. Um, and I nice. think that's all, all people need. Like yeah. a little bit of a, hey, by the way, this actually is what CrossFit is. You want to ask questions. Let, let's, let's totally take the the stigma away from what CrossFit is and the dangers and the poor technique and all of that, like that's evolving fast. Mm -hmm. um, people, are, people are trying to get involved in this. Well, I think that's one of the main reasons I wanted to talk about this because if we think about what areas of fitness have the most or the best capacity to actually get people into fitness and actually doing something where they can turn up, have fun, leave, and have a positive experience. CrossFit oh. is doing that like, like, fuck, I don't know, Zumba did 10 <laughs> years ago, like aerobics did 30 years ago. Yeah, but if you think about these kind of yeah. ways Inclusive of... Yeah, setting how exactly, engaged people you are. Exactly, right? and you look at a commercial gym environment, Unless you have a real reason to be there, like a real burning desire other than I yeah. want to get fitter and healthier, it is. you do have to get motivated for it. You have to find that motivation <laughs> every time. But you walk into a CrossFit gym, there's people saying, how are you doing? Right, let's get into a group. We'll start doing mobility. And it's a totally different animal. 
How many times have you started a workout, got halfway through and thought, kind of done with this now? Uh, not, not, I mean, I'll be honest, not often, because I'm very driven to train for my own yeah. personal reasons. So I yeah. don't get it that often, but I only ever get that when I'm, I'm not programming properly or maybe I need a bit of a rest and my body yeah. just is telling me to just fuck off out the gym and chill. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it doesn't often happen with me. I mean, I couldn't ever, or well, not where I'm at right now, I couldn't ever do CrossFit as the only thing because I feel yeah. I need some specific programming. Yeah, yeah. But if I was someone that just wanted to literally just be healthy, lift some stuff, look good, well, I'd probably turn up to CrossFit because someone's going to program for me. I'll get good training yes. and I'll make some friends. But yeah. I would only ever do CrossFit probably once or twice a week because I need external specific programming. Just yeah. like as an athlete, you're trying to uh, program specifically for yourself. You're not turning up and doing something random, are you? No, no. Like I have two programs I'm following at the minute. I have the MoveFit plan, which is like, it's in it's in like a periodized section to run up the run up to the open. So it's like preparing me for everything I need, giving me exposure to like different intensities, frequencies, weights, body movements. Whereas I also have a bespoke program for me to work on my specific needs. I have a bit of a knee injury at the minute. I'm rehabbing every day, but my weaknesses lie in my gymnastics and my capacity. And um, so unfortunately, my coach knows this. Uh, so every day I'm doing like dog work for the capacity side um, and I'm also working on my upper body strength I'm trying to build my shoulders some people think my shoulders look massive but they're not they're actually tiny in comparison to what I need them to be and um, for what I want to be able to achieve so constantly working on my gymnastics my core engagement I uh, lose that at times and um, um, and so I have two types of programming I could easily if that's for specific, that's like athlete driven, this is what I need to get to the next level. But we're talking about a CrossFit gym and how you like the health and wellness um, pyramid of CrossFit. What we're saying is that people are wanting to come in and train every element of their body to be a more functional person. So I don't want people to be put off thinking they couldn't do CrossFit without a bespoke program. They absolutely can. We program in the box generically and it's written for the fittest and modified for everybody else and that's not a problem i like that written for the fittest and modified for whoever needs it needs applying to i like that everyone can do the same workout in our gym there's a couple of older women fiona and irene specifically and i love them they walk in with their nanos on and they're like, you know, they're older. They're in their 50s and 60s. And they'll come in and I'll be like, right, Fiona, are you doing the one o'clock? And she's like, yeah, I am. She throws on her vest and she throws down. Like, she, like both of them are really inspirational. And, and I'll do a box jump at 30 inches, but they'll stack 220 plates and jump on that. I'll do cleans at 70 and they'll still use a bar, an eight kilo bar, maybe with fives on the side, and, and they'll hit their cleans. Um, when we do pull-ups, they might do jumping pull-ups, or they might use um, supine pull to the barbell stacked on the rig. Like they'll just modify everything. At the end of the day, it's all relative. Mm. They are getting fitter. They are getting stronger with what they are capable of doing, with what their base fitness is now, with what their strength is now. I remember when they first turned up, and they didn't do any of those things. A lot of it was just body weight work. Um, and as they've evolved and as they've grown and got more confident and happier and fitter and healthier, they're doing double unders and deadlifts. Like, I'm pretty sure if you've got like a hundred kilo deadlift over there, like 90 kilos with perfect form, you can't tell me that's not absolutely awesome. Mm, mm. I agree. I totally agree. Um, right. I, do you know what? I think I've covered all my questions. I think we've done it. Do you think there's anything? Did we actually we... did it? <laughs> yeah, I think we did it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Do you think there's anything CrossFit related that you need to get off your chest? Do you think there's anything we haven't covered? There's loads. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> there is. Like, come on. This is like the most exciting thing ever. So we spoke a little bit about the training, a little bit about the program, and a little bit about nutrition. But we've not really spoke about the skills. We've not really spoke about grit, determination, mindset, um, all of that sort of stuff. I think there's loads to cover. However... What do people want to know? There must be something in here that we've not covered that your audience and my pals that have watched this 
Hi guys. All Shout right. out to Mum. All right, <laughs> well, what, what we'll do is we'll strike a deal. We'll let this podcast fly and then we will reach out to the wider community and say, look, what didn't we cover? What else do you want us to talk about? And we can potentially do a part three, but I don't want you getting greedy and using up all the podcast space, right? Okay. So, uh, Shelley, uh, I will thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it today. Thanks for joining me here in the Alps. <laughs> I wish I was there with my snowboard. Well, you're dressed for the occasion. <laughs> Uh, if anyone wants to find Shelley after today, uh, do. I mentioned last time she's very hot and cool and knowledgeable and insightful. What? So, do you remember last week? I got in trouble for this for about five people. Last week you were like, Shelley, who are you and what do you do? But I was super nervous and I couldn't actually tell you. I never even mentioned what I actually do or that I went to uni or that I went to school. I never even told you that. Well, but now you're like, you're super knowledgeable and well-educated. That is true, but I never told you before. So are you, what are you saying? You want to do a belated, this is who I am? No, but I'm just saying, I got in trouble last time because I was like, uh, I love CrossFit, I do CrossFit, I train CrossFit, <laughs> I do CrossFit. <laughs> Whereas really, um, I went to university to study sport and exercise science. I was a sports coach and a PT, um, and then I did a lot of movement stuff. Um, and now I have two degrees and honours and a master's and a company that works with movement um, and I'm a human rehabilitation and movement specialist. So that encompasses like physio type but it also just opens the gate a little bit more to the biomechanics side and mobility and working with athletes. So being down here already, I've already had three people approach me about their movement and how I might be able to help them with it. Um, and I never told you that before, but I was just nervous. We did tie that up in your story, but you didn't tell us how many degrees you've got. Well, I went to uni for a couple of years because I really love to learn. I love research and I love to learn. I really like the organization of uni and no one in my family had actually been to university. So when I told my mom I was going, she was like psyched. So I just thought I'd stay there for a while. Plus I made a bunch of friends. <laughs> Aberdeen was a nice place to be and yeah. So uh, yeah, so she is a clever person. She's got way more degrees than I have. Um, if you want to follow her on Instagram, she is C F Shelley S. H R E I L I. Will you smash that? that. <laughs> F Shelley. S H E L I. C F S H E L I. C F Shelley. Uh, and you're the same on Twitter, aren't you? Yes, sir. And then Shelley McCoy on Facebook and C Complete Physique is the website. Uh, Shelley, thanks very much for being on the show again. For all of you listening, thanks for partaking. It's nearly Christmas. Um, I will have a festive show up because uh, a podcast will go up on the 29th, which will be kind of the Christmas show. Uh, if you are looking to work with me, us, Body Type Nutrition in the new year, Fat Loss for Life will be launching again in January 2017. We will also be launching Built for Life, which is a 12-week lean muscle building program so we're now taking what we've learned from the fat loss program we did and we're doing that with uh, built for life that's a group coaching program so it's very cost effective for people if you are a vegan or a vegetarian we are also running green for life and if you want to really get nitty gritty on your mindset we are running Mindset for Life. So come January 2017, we are launching four group coaching programs. Check out and keep uh, abreast of social media in the coming uh, weeks. And you will see uh, my book, How to Be an Awesome Personal Trainer, is imminent, very imminent. Otherwise, that's it for I'm me. I'm going to need that. Uh, every personal trainer needs that. Agreed. This is an awesome book. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And it's brutally honest. So trainers are going to need to be ready for the honesty in this book. Yeah, it's just like the inner workings of your mind. And to be honest, you're no smarty. You don't sugarcoat a thing, do you? So No point. No point. No. There's only so much you can rub shit in glitter. Still going to smell. Fair right. One. See you later, Sherry. We're off. We're off. Bye. Thank you for Thanks being on the so show. Much, for everyone later. listening. Laters, Bye. taters. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number... Well, I better have a look, haven't I? Let me get it right. 235, hello.